Now, let's be clear, narcissistic people aren't missing empathy. They have the capacity for empathy. It's not like it's a chip in their brain that wasn't snapped in when their hardware was being programmed. They have what we call variable empathy. Their own stuff, their own emotions, their own needs drown out the ability for narcissistic people to be there for other people when they need it. Okay, everyone, so I want to yeah, put it in the comments. What do you think? Is running to the head of a line that others are waiting in because you're really busy, is that entitled? Is showing up to a meeting late and expecting people to fill you in on that meeting, is that entitled? Is expecting people to listen to you, but then when they talk not being really interested, is that entitled? Is telling someone that you are having an emergency, but you really aren't, so that they will call you back ahead of other people. Is that entitled? Drop your thoughts in the comments and let's figure this out. I'm Dr. Romani here to talk to you about narcissism. This is a channel that helps people understand narcissism and the impact it has on their relationships. Most of the content leans toward those who are experiencing these relationships and are completely befuddled. This is a group that is completely underserved by the mental health community. Nobody really takes on how to help them. And they are either faced with enablers or mental health practitioners that ask them to reflect on their contribution to the relationship. This community of people struggling in these relationships, I will say, despite what today's video is going to be about, that community remains my focus. And however, though, I get many, and I mean many emails, comments, you name it, from people who are concerned that they themselves are the ones who are narcissistic. And they are now wondering if they are hurting people, which I think is a great first step. I do believe that in a subset of these cases of people wondering that they're narcissistic, they're actually not narcissistic, you're not. They're actually people who have been told that they are narcissistic by the narcissistic people in their lives so many times that they believe it. And because most survivors of narcissistic abuse are almost too empathic, they get so concerned with hurting other people that they think they're hurting other people when they're not. It gets messy. But despite that, I have no doubt that there's a small and maybe even not so small subset of these emails that we are getting that are actually from people who are slowly becoming self-aware narcissists. This is not meant to be a series that fosters false hopes for the survivors of narcissistic abuse. You know I'm very careful to not do that. However, if indeed you do believe you have these sorts of narcissistic patterns and you want to start addressing these patterns, I actually believe it's a very worthy fight, a very worthy cause, and I want to support that and I respect that, frankly. If you are in a relationship with a narcissist, I do not think it is realistic that you can stay in the relationship and that the person would change. However, if you think that you're narcissistic and you're willing to take the time and do the work, I'm going to be honest with you, it may not save the relationship that you are in. Sometimes those fault lines run too deep. But the bottom line is it could help your mental health, which is what's most important. Walking around with a narcissistic personality style is very unhealthy. It's basically living a life characterized by rage, constantly floating through your body, and that's not good for you. To always feel threatened and unsafe, that's not nice, that's not pleasant. And as always, it is absolutely essential that you get into therapy and do the work there with somebody who knows how to do this work. Narcissism often co-occurs with other mental health issues and all of these issues need to be addressed by a trained professional. Now in this series, I am going to walk you through all those central pillars of narcissism I always talk about on the other videos. I'm going to introduce you again to why each of these things matters if you think you're narcissistic and most importantly I'm going to give you some tips on how to improve in these areas. If you watch this video and say, screw this lady, I can't be bothered, then that's on you. It's not my job to convince you. But my advice is then that you take a step back from other people. Please stop invalidating and hurting them. If you say, well, upon watching this video, I'm going to try, and I know I'm not always going to get it right, but you still get it right some of the time, I promise you, it's really, really going to make a difference. 
So I started at the top of this video talking about entitlement. Let's take on entitlement. I actually believe this issue of entitlement is one of the biggest issues of our time, and it's probably the biggest issue and problem raised by narcissism. This is a big one, and it's not, this is not just an issue for people with narcissistic personalities, but frankly, anyone who behaves in an entitled manner. We are living in the era of entitlement. There's no two ways about that. But entitlement, as we know, is a core element of narcissism. If you are someone who is aware or believe that you have narcissistic patterns and you want to address them to be better for yourself, to be better for those around you, tackling entitlement is a big piece of this journey. What is entitlement? It's the belief that someone has about them, their specialness, this belief that they are more special than anyone else and as such, they deserve special privileges or treatment without having earned or maybe purchased them. For example, a person walking onto a train or a plane expecting a first class seat without having paid for it simply because they think they deserve it. That's a simple form of entitlement, right? It's easy to think about what entitlement is when it comes to things like waiting in line, right? Entitled people cannot bear waiting in line or even waiting in traffic during rush hour. It's easy to understand when we talk about a first class seat or a fancy, I don't know, hotel room or something visible like that. But entitlement can also take in a lot more territory than just waiting in line. It's the belief that a person has that they believe that they can just do and say what they want without consideration of others, speak when they want, say what they want, do what they want, without thinking for a minute about how this affects other people or whether that behavior or speaking or whatever is appropriate in the circumstance. In essence, entitled people sort of take their half out of the middle without thinking and then they get angry when they're called out on it. I recently, actually, some time ago, but relatively recently, had someone repeatedly text me on a day I was out sick from work. They were clearly informed that I was out sick. They then sent a message in all caps, emergency, you have to call me now. So good therapist person that I am, I drag myself out of bed and I call the person back. There was no emergency. They just expected and wanted a call back and they knew by putting in emergency, they'd get a call back. It's a great example of entitlement. They felt that they had the entitlement to a sick person's time because they wanted it when they wanted it. And then they were put off when I was angry. Entitlement is deeply connected to lack of empathy because entitled people do not account for other people's feelings or experience. Jumping to the head of a line where people have already been waiting for an hour that doesn't, for a person to do that, they're not taking into account the experience of the people in that line who've already been waiting. Insisting, for example, like I said, on a sick person's callback, that doesn't take into account how that, the illness of that person, how, it's experiencing, how they're experiencing that. There's also a top note of grandiosity built into entitlement, right? Somehow a person is so great and so special that silly rules can't apply to them. And that, that is the core of entitlement, right? The rules do not apply to the entitled person. And yet, the entitled person believes the rules should apply to everyone else, no matter what the risks are. Entitlement is a very antagonistic trait. And if people could address this entitled behavior, it would actually make a huge difference in addressing narcissism, your own narcissism, as well as make the world function a lot better. If you are worried that you are narcissistic and want to be better and do better and behave better, here are some ideas for addressing entitlement. First, don't confuse being special with getting special treatment. People who are entitled believe that they are somehow special and deserve special treatment. Either it is the case that we are all special or none of us are special. That's a philosophical question, right? So even if we take the kinder twist on this, that all of us are special, then all of us also have to follow the rules and be considerate of other people. This idea that if I am not getting special dispensation or special treatment, then I am not special, it's not true. And it really does require a shift in thinking. You are special, so am I. 
So is everyone else in that line. So we all have to follow the rules. Having to wait for your turn doesn't mean that you are lacking something or that you are not special. Number two, learn to be mindful and regulate in the moment. This isn't easy to do, but if you can learn this, you're really more than halfway there. When a person is entitled, there is that belief that the rules do not apply to them. And if someone applies the rules to them, then it creates something called an ego injury. Regulation is everything when it comes to managing the patterns of narcissism. Do things like this, learn to breathe, learn to do exercises like focusing on your surroundings, taking everything in. Start to carry something around with you to read or something to do if that helps, like a game on a phone. But learn to regulate. I'm not telling you to be a doormat. Certainly it shouldn't be the case that others who have waited a shorter time than you go ahead of you. But advocate for yourself appropriately, regulate, and follow the rules. You can't always have what you want when you want it. I understand that. That doesn't feel good. But it's a normal part of life. We learn that lesson when we're two years old. Learning to regulate at these times is half the battle of most of the interpersonal difficulties raised by narcissism. Number three, dig into your core beliefs. It is a distorted assumption to believe that rules apply to you but don't apply to someone else. Where did those beliefs come from? How are they useful to you? Every single one of us has a little bit of entitlement. A, a full disclosure, let me tell you a story. I remember once, many, many years ago, my children were very small, having to take my child to an appointment. And, I, and it was all at the last minute, and I had to wait 45 minutes or an hour longer than would be normal. I had to take a bunch of time off from work to be there, drive across town. Again, it was all last minute. It made a mess of work. It resulted in a loss of money that day. It created, it created much more work for me later that week, blah, 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 all these complaints. I remember getting kind of worked up in that moment, feeling like my time was more valuable since some of the other people there in the waiting room, I knew some of them actually, I knew they weren't currently employed out of the home so they didn't have to take time off from work. And I was getting a bit antsy and frankly, I was getting a bit bitchy. I could feel the, oh, it must be nice that you didn't have to take time off from work. I could feel that anger brewing up in, in me and I sat with that and I didn't like my thoughts or feelings. I thought they were kind of gross. And then this thought, my, fr my frustration at this situation, it's not the fault of the woman at the reception desk. It's not the fault of the people in the waiting room. It's a wake up call to me that maybe I need to fix my damn life and just breathe and be a comfort to my child who wasn't feeling well rather than getting all worked up. Walking through my core beliefs about some ancient stuff about some of my hurts and how my life went in childhood almost led me to be unkind to the people working there, which is entitled and it's not okay. But getting to my core beliefs helped me regulate in that moment. Number four, try and watch the situation from the outside. The fact is that many entitled people in the world, if they watched another entitled person, would kind of wrinkle their nose and say, oh God, that's awful. What a badly behaved, awful, ridiculous, a-hole person. So watch yourself from the outside. Think of how your behavior would be judged by someone else. If you think you would see your behavior badly or it would be judged badly by someone else or if it was someone else, then don't do it. Breathing can help at these times too. And if you don't think your behavior is bad, then you may need a lot more support and help than obviously this video can offer. Number five, create some interpersonal space. Listen to people. Do not interrupt them. This is where those empathy exercises I talked about in that other video in this series can also go a long way to addressing entitlement. Your view, your life is not more important than someone else's in a given moment. Hold space for multiple viewpoints, even if you don't agree with them. Your experience is no more valuable or important than someone else's. Value the time and space of others. In a world of text messages, emails, and constant access to other people, constantly reaching in whenever you need something and not accounting for the experience of the other person is not acceptable. It's a big reason why our world is falling apart the way it is right now. 
Respecting other people's boundaries is a major part of pushing back on entitlement. Number six, be on time. It is said that punctuality is the courtesy of kings, and I would suppose queens. But be on time. To roll in late somewhere and expect that people should bring you up to speed is not acceptable and it's deeply entitled. Being on time, whether you are at the top or the bottom of a hierarchy, is a simple and respectful way to push back on your own entitlement. I'm not saying that any of this is easy. Switching away from a mindset of entitlement is no small task. This is even harder if you grew up like this and watched a family system behave in an entitled manner and then this was normalized for you and it still is normalized if everyone in your family still does this. It is difficult if you are privileged and you have power whether through wealth or birthright or power within a system. Privileged people are kind of used to getting to be entitled but it doesn't matter. Entitlement's unacceptable. Maybe you don't have to wait in lines, but entitlement is way more than just waiting your turn in line. It's about being aware of yourself with other people, of not speaking over them, of being aware of their needs as well as your own, of being present and of recognizing that the rules apply to everyone and that you are not always the exception to the rule. Listen, in life, of course it's sometimes nice to get a little perk, Sometimes you get the better seed. Sometimes you get a little special indulgence. It's a treat, not the rule. Recognize the difference. If you can manage this, it is a major step in managing patterns associated with a narcissistic personality style. If we could find a way in the population as a whole to push back on entitlement, we would dial down the toxicity of the world tremendously. Entitlement hurts other people. It's uncomfortable for other people. It bothers other people. Last tale I'll tell. I remember for years being in a group that met a couple of times a month. The meeting, I don't know, started at some set time. And it's been the same set time for like a long time. And the same person every time would saunter in 20 minutes late with a cup of coffee that they bought. Now, if they bought the coffee, they had the time to go buy the coffee and were always, always late. It was such an entitlement because then they would immediately, upon sitting down, start talking over the other people in the room. This went on for years and years and years. Nobody ever gave this person feedback because they knew that this person would be so rude, verbally hostile, and abusive to them that the person kind of just sort of got silently enabled because nobody could be bothered. Ultimately, this person incredibly narcissistic person just kind of got away with it but they simply didn't care and it really really impacted sort of the health and the functioning of that system whether in the workplace a family or close relationship it's all about being self-reflective something we call mentalization can I look inward and think about how I affect others to think about how I impact a situation understand that and you can push back on entitlement. It'll make a big difference. Now, dysregulation is what makes narcissism so eggshell walky for everyone else. Now, dysregulation takes in a lot of territory. One of the key pieces of dysregulation is impulsivity. And that's when a person acts out without thinking about the consequences of their behavior. And impulsivity can be a behavior, like if you were to throw something, if you're angry or screeching off in a car, This can be verbal, which is what we actually probably really most commonly see in narcissistic folks, saying whatever comes to their mind, no matter how hurtful it is, without thinking about the consequences. But verbally, it can also include speaking, texting, emailing, any form of communication that's just completely unfiltered. This can be financial impulsivity, spending a bunch of money on something without thinking about the ramifications. There's also what we call emotional dysregulation, which is the inability to manage any kind of strong emotion. And when that emotion comes up in somebody, they lash out at other people. For example, emotions that they may lash out with include anger, when they're sad, when they're anxious or reactive. And that reactivity is a signature of narcissism. It's the really quick zero to 60 anger reactions that come any time that things don't go the narcissist's way. The core of dysregulation is that a narcissistic person doesn't have what I sort of call an internal thermostat to regulate themselves. 
So they use stuff outside of themselves. Narcissistic people, for example, often regulate using drugs or alcohol or other people. They offload their attention by yelling at other people or food or spending or validation seeking. And typically, it's some many people do all of the above. So basically, they outsource regulation, which is supposed to be an inside job, actually, for healthy people, that we regulate ourselves. Now, many times, narcissistic people will say, I can't help myself, okay? Or, I'm sorry, I get it. I wasn't supposed to say it that way. I wasn't supposed to say that. The apologies don't tend to be sincere. It's never really about the hurt you might have caused to someone else. It's about the, okay, I get there's rules, and I got caught not being the way everyone wants. That kind of apology doesn't feel good. Narcissistic people, after they have their tantrum, after they have their tantrum, that's when they'll say they're sorry, after they've completely rattled another person, and then even say nonsense about, oh, I'm really actually really thankful for you, I'm grateful for you. But clearly they weren't so grateful for you that they had no problem verbally vomiting all over you. But if you suspect that you are narcissistic, you can help yourself. And the way you do that is you wait that extra beat before you speak. Maybe it's five seconds and then you don't yell. You don't send the text. You don't send the email. You don't storm out. Listen, folks, you have a frontal lobe. It works. Let it do its job. However, it's going to be harder for you to inhibit than for a person who's not narcissistic. Healthy, well-regulated people can stop themselves. They may not even want to say something hurtful in the first place, but healthy people get angry. And sometimes they get so angry that they wish they could send the angry text. They wish they could tell their boss or their colleague or their friend to F off. But they don't. Healthy people catch themselves. They breathe through it. Maybe they take a walk. Maybe they talk to a friend. Maybe they take a shower. Maybe they take a run. But they bring themselves down without lashing out at someone else. The dysregulation and impulsivity of narcissism are what do a significant part of the emotional damage of this narcissistic pattern. And for the narcissistic folks out there watching this who really want to honestly change, if you were to actually only pick one thing to address in your personality style, let it be this. The dysregulation is what makes narcissistic folks scary. It's what leaves people feeling that you are unpredictable. It's why some people avoid you and even distance themselves and it's why people are really anxious and walk on eggshells around you because they never know what will set you off. So the answer is that don't react in a volatile manner when you get set off and people won't be so anxious around you. Dysregulation and impulsivity in narcissism serve a very particular function. They let narcissistic people reduce their tension blow off steam, as it were. Dysregulation episodes really often look like adult tantrums. The narcissistic person yelling and screaming and whining and fussing and sending inappropriate texts and posting stuff on social media and sending inappropriate emails and drugging or drinking. Then the tension is released and they might even look calm and fine afterwards. Now, Everyone else around the narcissistic person or anyone else around the narcissistic person is kind of shattered, by the way, but the narcissist looks calm. And this is how one of the most common things that plagues nar people in narcissistic relationship, how it unfolds. The narcissistic person gets set off by some ego injury or frustration. The narcissistic person lashes out at someone else. The other person gets upset. Maybe the other person they lashed out at raises their voice too. Maybe they cry because they're hurt. Now, the narcissistic person, by yelling, has already released their tension by screaming at that other person who's now upset. So now the narcissistic person is calm. And then the narcissistic person gaslights the other person and says in a calm voice, you need to calm down. What is wrong with you? Why are you so emotional? It wasn't that big deal. You look crazy. This is a classical maneuver. It is manipulative and is not okay. You have to take ownership for your behavior. Listen, all of us, every person out there has these episodes of psychological tension. And the things that well-regulated, healthy people do include 
them. Like I said, they may cry or take a walk or take a shower or go to therapy, talk to friends, journal, pray, meditate, punch a boxing bag, go to the gym, watch a silly movie, read a book. And then we come down and calm down or the moment passes and we don't hurt someone else. Yelling at other people, demanding that people listen to your one-sided diatribe, throwing stuff, blaming other people, that is not regulated. Lots of narcissistic people want to say, and they've said it to me, they've said it to me many times, listen, this is just how I am. I have to be accepted the way I am. Let me have my tantrum and everything will be okay. No, that's not an option. Your tantrums scare kids, coworkers, family members, dogs, cats, therapists, and strangers. Narcissism is not psychosis. Psychotic people may not always be able to keep it together, but you can when it matters to you, right? If you're narcissistic. When narcissistic folks want to look good in front of someone else, they're able to keep it together. So that means you can take a moment if you're narcissistic and get this more right. And this dysregulation and reactivity are actually not good for your health and can really magnify cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and other stress-sensitive health issues. For example, your immune functioning. So, think you're a narcissist? What do you do? Number one, recognize that for the rest of your life, and let's just start with today, you have to be mindful in all that you say and do. In its simplest form, mindfulness and regulation that really just involve waiting a beat before you do something or say something. Before you say something to someone else, especially if you're charged up, stop, wait, think about how it'll affect someone else, and then and only then say it. I'm, I know it's not easy. In fact, it's quite similar to the struggle that recovering addicts go through every day of their lives. For example, they, they can no longer drink, so they commit to sobriety and a hundred times a day have to stop themselves before they grab a bottle, go into a bar, say yes to a drink. For a narcissistic person who wants to be better, you have to commit to thinking before you speak or before you act. It can take months and years and even a lifetime to get this really right, and no one gets it right every time. Even the healthiest people sometimes say the wrong thing. But if you get it right 75% of the time, you will have greatly improved the lives of those around you and you will have done wonders for yourself. So stop, think, breathe, and only then speak if you still need to. Number two, watch your tone. Don't yell, don't menace, don't be passive aggressive, don't demean. Don't talk down to people. Don't yell at people. Try to put a smile in your words. And again, this is hard if you're frustrated or angry. But tone can be a real part of impulsivity. It can be what can take a sentence and make it dismissive or harsh. This all relates back to that point in number one of stop, think, breathe, and only then speak. And always be mindful and watch your tone. Number three, don't send the text or the email. Texting for narcissistic people is the equivalent of giving a child, a three-year-old child a grenade. It's a tool that narcissistic people routinely abuse because texting is built for impulsivity. The challenge with texting or DMing is that it's too easy and too fast. There really should be an anti-impulsivity function on texting devices that force you to answer, are you sure you want to send this text before you send the text? It's interesting, the other day a pizza delivery platform asked me if I'm sure before I place my order. Ordering a pizza is lower stakes than raging and saying unforgivable things at another human being. So clearly it can be built in. Instead of opening your texting app when you're feeling angry, write the text if you feel like you need to into your notes application on your phone and then don't send it. Sleep on it for 24 hours and then only then look at it. Odds are, if indeed you are committed to behaving in a better and less narcissistic way, you will say, hmm, probably not a good idea to send this and delete it. With emails, don't do that. And you know what? Don't put a recipient in the two line. If you want to write your email, 
Sleep on it for 24 hours or send it to someone you trust so they can tell you if they think it's unhinged. It's very unsettling for another person to receive word salad, really long, angry, confusing, and accusatory emails. It's unsettling for other people to wake up to these emails because you're writing them in the middle of the night. It's unsettling for them to have their work days interrupted by these emails because you're writing them around the clock. And it's unsettling to have their days and nights punctuated with these dysregulated technological assaults. Don't do it. Number four, find whatever daily practice you need to help you regulate. That could be exercise, breathing, meditation, mindfulness, breath work, a hobby, that kind of focus on something that takes the emotional energy and transfers it into the physical can help release and also focus you. And as an aside, it's hard sometimes for people who have difficult personalities. Don't try to proselytize and convert people to your daily practice. It's for you. You don't have to convince everyone to join you in your breathwork success. If it works for you, bravo, that's wonderful. It can be just for you. And just because the rest of us don't do breath work, there's not something wrong with us. Number five, get therapy. Good therapists who know narcissism can walk you through this territory of managing these dysregulated moments. Number six, only minimally or ideally not at all, don't drink or use drugs. Putting alcohol and drugs on top of narcissism and its impulsivity is like dropping gasoline and matches on a California forest these days. The alcohol is an accelerant and it makes the impulsivity much more likely and the lashing out much worse. Drunk people are impulsive and sloppy. Narcissistic people are impulsive and lack empathy. The combination of the two is actually terrifying and damaging. And because a lot of narcissistic folks use drugs or alcohol to regulate, the likelihood of this alcohol and, and, or drug and narcissism combination is quite likely and it's real problematic. And saying, I didn't mean what I said when I was drunk, it doesn't fly because the other person was hurt. So it meant something to them. If you can't stop yourself from saying stuff, get sober. Stop drinking, stop using. It's the only way to address this very hurtful dysregulation pattern. Drug and alcohol use tend to be relatively common in narcissistic folks because it's a way for them to regulate and it makes the acting out worse. The only way to get to the core of the dysregulation is to stop all of it. Number seven, have a routine. One thing that helps with regulation is predictability for you. Have a routine. Whatever those are, whatever those might be, might be steps that you follow every morning, like boom, boom, boom. Have a schedule, have a routine, create predictability for yourself. This doesn't work by itself. It can't be the only thing you do. And you also need to be flexible in the face of disruptions to your schedule. It's not always going to go the way you want. But having some kind of routine combined with mindfulness, combined with controlling drugs and alcohol, can really help you sometimes have some handholds and benchmarks to count on during a difficult day and make it less likely that the frustration will get the best of you. Number eight, life is frustrating. A major core issue in dysregulation is that narcissistic folks do not like disappointment or frustration. None of us do. But for narcissistic folks, disappointment or frustration often turn into rage because they puncture the grandiosity and this idea of life needing to be perfect and everything going perfectly. Life happens. Stuff goes wrong. It's life. A combination of these techniques and a clear awareness that life is indeed messy everyone's lives are messy. You're not the exception to that. It's happening to everyone. That way of thinking can go a long way. As always, though, I applaud anyone who believes that they might have these narcissistic personality styles and wants to start turning the ship around a little bit. It takes time to shift behavior. It's painful. It's difficult. And there will always be some setbacks on some days. But you can also do it. It just means 24-7 mindful awareness and removing anything that weakens your ability to remain mindful. But trust me when I tell you it's worth it. It's worth it for you, for your mental health, for your overall health, and for the people around you. This is worth doing. Addressing dysregulation 
even if you're not doing it for the people around you, to do it for yourself at a minimum will address things like cardiovascular reactivity, the stuff that can really take a toll on your health. And if you can really get it figured out, it's going to make you a lot easier to be around. And you're going to notice the change in how people regard you. In the world of narcissism, empathy, let's face it, it's viewed as a sucker bet. Empathy, I mean, I guess it does. If you want to be cynical, it does make people less efficient. If you slow down to actually care about other people, well, that means lost time or less profit or actually having to give a damn. And we are not really living in an era where empathy is even valued. So let's clear it up by starting off with what exactly is empathy? Empathy is defined by the New Oxford Dictionary as the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. When we get into deeper psychological definitions, it's about an interest in the experience of another and the ability to reflect on how our own behavior or emotions may be affecting other people. Empathy is related to various concepts including compassion, kindness, self-awareness, and agreeableness. Now, empathy is different than sympathy. Sympathy is when you recognize that someone else is going through something difficult or that they are suffering. For example, when someone is experiencing a loss or an illness. Empathy takes in good and bad experiences. It's not just about suffering. That's the sympathy. Empathy is connected to things like emotional intelligence, the ability to be aware of someone else's experience and respond appropriately and accordingly. I am a big believer that you do not have to have gone through what someone else has gone through to be empathic. Yeah, I think it could be a little bit harder, but for example, I don't know, an outlandish example, if someone's office burned down and they lost all of their work, I personally haven't had that happen. Most of us have it, ha haven't had that happen. But we can have empathy for that. We understand that this person is struggling. We can hear them and be present with them and not complain about our own stuff to them and also understand that they may not be able to be available in the same way as usual and that they're grieving. We didn't go through it. We can empathize. Or a person we know may have gotten a big promotion. That will mean that they need to move far away. Empathy then may mean we can see that they're excited and they're happy and they're a little nervous. We don't have to have had the experience of being promoted and being offered a job far away, or even if we think that the place they have to move to is an awful place. We can still be present with their joy and not rain on their parade. And even if we're having a bad day, we can be happy for their good news. That's empathy. It means awareness of ourselves and awareness of another person's experience and being emotionally present for them. Now, let's be clear. Narcissistic people aren't missing empathy. They have the capacity for empathy. It's not like it's a chip in their brain that wasn't snapped in when their hardware was being programmed. They have what we call variable empathy. Their own stuff, their own emotions, their own needs drown out the ability for narcissistic people to be there for other people when they need it. That means that empathy in narcissism is more about alignment than it is about actual empathy. If a narcissistic person's having a good day and you're having a good day, then they'll be happy for you because they're happy. If they're having a bad day and you are having a good day, they will not be happy for you because they're focused on their bad day. If they're having a bad day and you're having a bad day, they may be able to say, yeah, I get it, ah, these bad days. It makes sense, but that's not empathy. That's coincidence. They can also turn it on. Narcissistic people can turn on empathy for their own needs, something we can call agentic empathy. A narcissistic person can say, okay, this person is sad. I can see that they're sad. I need to get something from them, so I'm going to comfort them with this whole sadness thing so I can get what I need. They may not say it out loud like that, but that's what they're thinking. Again, it's not empathy when it's solely instrumental or self-serving. Empathy means a person can self-monitor, understand the difference between their emotional world and someone else's emotional world, and be present. So if you are narcissistic and you want to work on your empathy, what do you do? First, 
You have to actually care about the other person. You cannot be empathic just to white knuckle and get through it like, oh, I just got to do this empathy thing just to get to the other side or because you need something from the person. Human connection, all human connection is based on actually giving a damn about another person. And if you are not able to get there, then that means therapy. That's beyond what we can do in this video. Now to find out the mental blocks you have, the lessons you got or didn't get in childhood about caring about others, those are the things you can hit in therapy. It's interesting. The kindest person I know told me that when she was a child, her mother told her that people that help other people and expect nothing in return are suckers. Yet my friend, this woman's daughter, is literally one of the most giving and kind people I know. Legacy doesn't mean destiny. Second, be mindful and present with other people. When someone is talking, listen. Don't play with your phone or stare off into the distance or watch TV. Listen. Make eye contact. Not creepy eye contact. Just regular eye contact. Be present. Ask questions. Be curious. Just asking those questions and reflecting back on someone's emotions and hearing them really goes such a long way to help someone feel supported, cared for, and empathized with. Third, don't make it about you. Don't always bring it back to you. Keep it on them. The error of so many narcissistic people is to take someone's tale of suffering and quickly bring it back around to them. Now, for example, for vulnerable narcissistic people, I do think that social, their social anxiety makes this worse. And the egocentricity of all narcissism means that they think everything's about you. Well, not everything is about you, especially not someone else's pain. If someone needs you, let them talk. And you can say, I understand. But you don't always feel, need to feel the need to launch into your story. The fourth way to tackle this is don't just try to fix it. Fixing isn't empathy. Fixing is a way of not having to deal with the emotion in a situation. Most situations that need empathy can't be easily fixed. They have to be gotten through. People with narcissistic personalities are simply not comfortable with emotion. Again, again learning how to do this emotional work is the work of therapy. Sometimes people just want people to listen and be with their uncomfortable emotions. If it could be fixed, the person probably would have fixed it by now. And the grandiosity of narcissism means that people who are narcissistic may say, yeah, no, no, I got this. I, got, I know a guy. I have a connection. I can call this person. I can call that person. I can make this happen. You can make all the calls you want, but the fact is when we need empathy, we need empathy. Perhaps that fixing can be helpful down the road, but initially, empathy means just being present and sometimes being with the discomfort of someone else's uncomfortable emotions. Give this a shot. Some of you say, please make content for those of us who want to, who want to get through our narcissistic patterns. I hear you. I hope a video like this is a start. Not having empathy, not caring, and being dismissive of other people and invalidating them it hurts them as much as if you slapped them across the face. If you believe you're narcissistic, you have to do your work to figure out your blockades against empathy. That's not the job of the people in your life. It's not their job to fix this for you. They're not your shrink. Find yourself a good one and do the psychological work. The people who are on the receiving end of your lack of empathy, they're out there in therapy, I promise you that, cleaning up the messes that this has resulted in for them. It actually makes more sense for those who are not showing the empathy in the first place to be the ones to figure out a way to fix it. And also a warning, those of you who are in relationships with narcissistic people who aren't ready to take on their narcissism, let me give you a word of advice. Please don't forward them this video. It's like calling them out and that never works. And honestly, I don't need the hate mail. So don't forward this to them. They're not ready for it. But if you really do think you have a narcissistic style and you really want to commit to doing better, good for you. I really want you to keep the faith and do the work. It's worth it. It won't be easy, but it's worth it. And let me promise you this, empathy feels better than any superficial achievement ever could. So again, I, have, I am someone who, have, I've heard it, I've, I've heard people say, you demonized narcissist, you are not a nice person. I actually work very closely with many, many narcissistic clients and we've done some interesting work. I see the holes and I see that some people can do the work and some people can't. But I do want people to know that ultimately I think empathy is important, whatever side of this you are on. 
But the fact is, if you do suspect that you do have narcissistic tendencies and you want to break out of this cycle, this is not work someone else can do for you. You're going to have to step up to the plate and start recognizing that you need to give a damn about other people and be present and practice that empathy muscle. It will be well worth the workout. Narcissism and related personality patterns reflect a problem with regulation, with not being able to soothe oneself internally without having to turn to something outside of them, outside of you, if this is how you suspect you go through life and go through the world. And that could be anything from drugs and alcohol to shopping to needing people to tell you you are great or being available to you whenever you want and getting angry at them when they won't be available to you. Now, in a healthy person, and, and it this sort of pattern being healthy is often a byproduct of healthy attachment experiences in childhood. In a healthy person, a healthy person can soothe themselves, whether by self-talk, breathing, or turning to other people in an appropriate manner. And by appropriate, I mean things like waiting for your next therapy appointment instead of contacting the therapist 20 times with non-emergency messages before your session, or sending someone 20 texts in the middle of the night, or asking a friend if they can talk it out at exactly the time they're not available and getting mad at them. That's not healthy. Now, we all have moments when we may need something to take the edge off, but healthy means that more often than not, you can manage your highs, manage your lows, and feel confident that you are able to manage all of them. So in a dysregulated pattern like narcissism, using things outside of yourself to regulate is commonplace. And this is where this issue of validation seeking, which is such a signature element of narcissism, comes in. At a superficial level, it's easy to view validation seeking as a person who is bragging and arrogant and posturing. And, in, and it looks like that. And in part, it is that. But there's something much, much bigger. The validation is something a narcissistic person needs. It's how they keep the feelings of insecurity and inadequacy at bay. Listen, not in anybody's life can every day be a good day. On some days, there are bills to pay and you may not have enough money for them. There may be bad news from work, broken dishwashers, relationship problems, or even just straight up boredom. We deal. But alas, narcissistic folks don't deal. The validation seeking is something that helps people manage when they are reminded but that they're just a regular person. And people are narcissistic, don't like being reminded they're regular people. If you have to deal with disappointments and frustrations, well, then you aren't very special, are you? Or at least that's how it can feel. So seeking out validation, whether on social media or having or owning stuff that gets you validation, that could be money or a car or a job or a fancy house or an attractive partner, all of that can help a person regulate self-esteem and the sense of inadequacy that so many people with narcissistic personalities have. Listen, narcissism is an outside job. And what I mean by that is that the narcissistic person is fully reliant on the outside world for everything. They have to turn to the outside world to figure out what a great person is supposed to be, what good goals are supposed to be. And people who are narcissistic turn to the outside world to tell them that they're okay or that they're great. Frankly, it's a terrible and exhausting way to live. It's like having to rely on the outside world for your most fundamental needs like food and water and air. And when the world isn't available or gives confusing messages or you live to please the world, then obviously a person can never find or be their true selves. And being a narcissist is forever living in the false self, or at least the self that is in service to the world. Validation seeking behavior is so central to the psychology of narcissistic people because it is in essence how they regulate. As long as the world is telling me that I'm great, then I'm great. As long as I get likes and followers, 
then I'm great. It gives the narcissistic person a sort of suit of armor, a protection against the inadequacy that's bubbling up. And then it becomes a habit. Basically, the narcissistic person is constantly seeking reassurance. But to everyone else, it doesn't look like reassurance seeking. It looks like the narcissistic person bragging and living their best life, quite frankly. In this way, for example, narcissistic folks have a very complicated relationship with social media, something I've talked about in another series on this channel. They love it because it is such an efficient way to get validation, and they hate it because they need it. This pattern is interesting because it actually does work for the narcissistic person. It gets them the thing they need so they can regulate their self-esteem and regulate their identity and keep those feelings of inadequacy pushed down. But it gets really off-putting for everybody else. Other people get really annoyed by the constant bragging and other people also get exhausted feeling that they always have to keep bringing narcissistic supply and praising the narcissistic person. It wears other people out because it leaves a relationship feeling like a one-way street or basically a relationship that only works if they are your fan club. Now, please drop a comment if you can identify how this pattern has played out in your own life. If you believe you have narcissistic tendencies, what strategies have you used in order to receive validation from other people? Or if you have someone who has narcissistic tendencies in your life, what have they done to try to get validation from you or from other people? It'll be interesting to see all the different kinds of validation seeking techniques there are out there. So if you think you are a narcissist, what do you do about this pattern, this habit, this need for validation? Number one, it's going to be hard. Consider a social media fast or break or limits. While it's not the only way a person seeks validation, it's one of the more common. By cutting it out, you then will need to find better and more internal ways of regulating. It's like taking all of the sweets out of your kitchen if you're trying to eat healthier. It's a really good start, but you still need to find a way to get through those moments you want the sweets. And also, as sort of a side, line, a side element to this, also stop looking at other people's social media. That is part of this sort of social media fast because it just whets your appetite to want to look for validation for yourself. Number two, start developing new ways of regulating that involve only you. Exercise, walking, breathing, meditating, mindfulness, reading, walking your dog, even watching TV. Ideally, watching something that may change your mindset and perspective. And most importantly, all of these things that don't require other people to validate or reassure you. Number three, practice listening. And this is in every video in the series, I'm saying this. Validation seekers often hijack and dominate conversations and talk about themselves. Listen to other people talk and give them reinforcement and feedback that is helpful. Learning the other half of the dance that other people have been doing for you can be a useful lesson and create more balance in how you have conversations going forward. Basically, what I'm saying is turn that one-way street of a conversation with you into a two-way street. Number four, you got to seek out therapy. It will be uncomfortable to cut back on the validation seeking. So seeking out therapy as a place to talk about how it feels to not seek out or not maybe even get the validation can really feel vulnerable but it's really important work to get to the core of this dynamic. And for those of you watching, how about you do some of my job for me here? Can you think of other recommendations for cutting back on validation seeking? As always, use that comment, that comment section as sort of another living, breathing part of this video and let us know. A common criticism of narcissistic people is 
Why is everything always about them? The answer to that is because the narcissistic person feels it has to be about them. So they feel heard and validated and regulated. But it's a pattern that has to be addressed if a person is to break these cycles and have a fighting chance of developing healthier relationship. Now, envy is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. It's a universal experience for every narcissistic person. Now, envy is something that's obviously quite human. We envy people who have more or better or different. So the issue really becomes degree. For the rest of us, the envy may pass from time to time. But for people with narcissistic personalities, it is pervasive and almost constant. There is not a day that would go by without envy being a central element of their day. Please, you know, if you suspect, if you think at all you're narcissistic or have narcissistic personality or you're envious of people on a regular basis or you have someone in your life who is an envier, drop it in the comments. Let's see how many of you we got. Now, what's it about? Why is envy such a central characteristic of narcissism? Well, it kind of makes sense since the core conflict or the core wound in narcissism is the feeling of inadequacy and insecurity that bubbles up and results in a feeling of shame, envy is sort of a manifestation of that constant threat, the, uh, the threat that someone has it better, which then crushes that sense of grandiosity. And that brings up negative feelings like resentment and anger, and that brings up shame, and then more anger and discontent and resentment. Envy is present in all forms of narcissism. It just looks different. In grandiose narcissistic people, the envy may show as putting someone down and making fun of someone like, oh, wow, oh, yeah, you got a new car? Mm, actually looks like you're driving last year's model. Not so impressive. In vulnerable narcissism, that envy may present as victimization. I would be doing more than they're doing if I only had a rich parent. In malignant narcissistic people, it may make someone a target. You know, that dude needs to come around here and, need, and that dude who's coming around here showing off, they need to stop doing that or maybe we need to let him know that. In communal narcissism, it will be exhausting attempts to look like they aren't envious because that isn't charitable or being envious that someone else is getting more validation for their charitable deeds. Narcissism is about the pursuit of status, and someone is always bound to have more. So as a result, the envy of the higher status of others is a constant experience in narcissism. The problem with envy is that saying unkind things about someone who may be doing better or have it easier can leave a bad taste in other people's mouths. It can hurt the people you are criticizing and can also leave you feeling ashamed that you went there. None of it looks good or feels good, but it is an almost reactive, reflexive reaction to the good fortune of other people. The narcissistic person can find it almost intolerable to be in the presence of that good fortune. Please, if, you're, if this is something you've experienced, drop a comment. What are some of the consequences that you have experienced as a result of being envious? Or what consequences have you witnessed other people experience for being envious? Now, on the flip side is that narcissistic people, if they aren't envying other people, they assume that other people envy them. Now, that can certainly serve as supply for a narcissistic person to know that other people covet what they are and who they are. It sort of props up their grandiose defenses and the entitlement and it works for them. But on the other hand, it also leaves narcissistic people believing that other people are always working an angle with them, are always using them or are out to get them or take advantage of them. This leaves a narcissistic person feeling that sort of constant sense of threat 
that makes them more likely to lash out or say something that is unkind or insensitive. It's a really difficult way to live. To think that the only reason someone is your friend or is dating you or is working with you is because you believe that they're in it for some kind of secondary gain or you end up choosing people where that's the case. Now, the origin of this envy is likely to be a mix of things. It could be watching a parent be envious or if you were feeling as though you were lacking something relative to others around you, especially when you were growing up. For example, if your family had less money or there were aspects of your family that left you feeling like you were not measuring up and you envied others for what they had or there was bullying around something that you were lacking. But it all comes down to insecurity, doesn't it? An insecure person will want what other people have in a bid to feel better about themselves. Now, entitlement also relates to envy. Entitled people believe that they are owed things and that they deserve things and should get things. And when those things don't happen, then there's anger. And entitlement can also drive envy because if you believe you should get something but you don't and someone else does, that unrealized entitlement then becomes envy as well as anger. Now, you might be wondering if envy is your thing, why do people have an issue with envious people? Well, envy makes people uncomfortable especially if it colors much of your communication with other people. I remember once talking with a very narcissistic guy who envied everyone who had bigger homes, better cars, etc., etc. Et Listening to him talk was exhausting. His malcontentedness, the constant comparison, it was tiresome and it was gross. He alienated everyone he spoke with and often left them feeling downright uncomfortable. And if you didn't have more stuff or status than him, he assumed then that you instead would be the one who was wowed by all the fancy stuff he had. There was no such thing as a pleasant or easy conversation with this guy. And it was always so unpleasant that ultimately nobody really wanted to spend time with him. And the people who did actually were typically working an angle. So if you think you're narcissistic and envy is an issue to, for you, what do you do about this in envy? Number one, you need to know that envy is a thing and it's not a nice thing. Envy can come out in different ways. And one way is passive aggressive comments. The whole, wow, must be nice to have your trust fund get you into a beach house. It's sort of cringy and it makes people uncomfortable. It puts you at odds with other people and that doesn't feel good, not for you and not for them. Second, you need to pay attention and do a deep dive on why status is so important to you. Is it a hedge against your insecurity? Is it a byproduct of having been, been bullied? Is it a message you receive from society, from your family? Whatever the origins are, this issue of status needs to be unpacked. Because the relentless narcissistic pursuit of status is the fuel for this envy. Number three, got to work on gratitude. I know that sounds gimmicky and annoying, but you got to work on it nonetheless. Envy is about discontent and resentment. If you could get more aligned with what you already have, it can help offset some of that envy. Even a brief accounting of gratitude each day. It could be built into meditation or journaling. Any of these things can be a bit of a hedge against this. Number four, ask other people their backstories. Who knows? Maybe it's someone you envy because of their new car. But maybe the rest of their life isn't all that. Talk to people. Don't just judge them on their new handbag or their great vacation or their car or their great job. Yeah, sure. Some of them may actually be the human lottery winners who have enviable lives. But you would be surprised that behind some of those seemingly ideal exteriors are stories that show you that all isn't as simple and wonderful as it may seem. Number five, 
work on this envy thing in therapy. Therapy is meant to be a safe space to be vulnerable, to share those feelings of envy in a non-judgmental, supportive space and have someone guide you through them. Therapy may help you to understand the origin of these feelings of envy, what else this may be masking, and by getting to the core of these feelings, they may not color your perception of the world and your relationship with people in the world. Number six, put down your fists and also recognize that everyone is not trying to play you, nor do they envy you. Some may, but just put your defenses down long enough to be vulnerable with other people. It may actually help you craft more meaningful and more depth oriented relationships. So please, you know, give us a comment. Can you think of other ways to work on letting go of envy? Again, as a review, envy is a classical and core dynamic of the narcissistic personality, and it makes life seem more combative and more lacking. It can put you at odds with other people and make you seem petty, which is not a nice way of being seen and may be why people don't like talking to you. While we all go there sometimes, all of us sometimes feel some envy, the less you can fall into this cycle. Just to do that, it becomes a key way to push back on a core dynamic of narcissism that very likely puts you at odds and sometimes hurts other people. Thanks again.